came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them on this condition, Will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. And the elders of Jabez said unto him, Give us seven days respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coast of Israel, and then, if there be no man to save us, we'll come out to thee. Then came the messengers to Gebeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. And Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they, and they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings. And his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen, cut them in pieces, and sent them throughout all the coast of Israel by the hands of the messengers, saying, Whoever does not come forth after Saul and after Samuel, the same thing shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out with one consent. And when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000. And the men of Judah, 30,000. And they said unto the messengers that came, This is what you say to the men of Jabesh Gilead. Tomorrow, by that time the sun be hot, you shall have help. And the messengers came and showed it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Or you just for a simple thought this morning, just something that uh, came to my mind again throughout this week. Don't really even have it put together. I jotted down a few notes here. But I want to say to you this morning, whoever that you may be, whether that you be in this congregation or you may be listening by way of internet or YouTube or Facebook, whatever that you may be going through, it may be a prolonged bout of sickness or it may be something emotional. It may be physical, it may be financial, whatever it may be, something related to your family or your job. But I've come with a word for you this morning. Hold on. Yeah. Help yeah. is on the way. Yeah. I said hold on for help is on the way. Amen. Have you ever been in that place where it just seemed like the night would never end and you wonder if God was even hearing your prayers but then the message came. You got this feeling down in your heart even though the sun was still not shining. Even though the clouds were still covering the brightness. Even though it was still dark and rainy and cloudy but there was something on the inside of you that gave you the courage to hold on because you knew down deep inside of you help was on the way. Amen. I tell you, church, God's never failed us and He'll never fail us now. Hallelujah to God. We can put our confidence and our trust in Him today. He will see us through each and every circumstance today. Now, we have an enemy. And it's not the person sitting beside you. We have an enemy. And it's not the denomination down the road. We have an enemy. And it may not be many of the things that we contribute as our enemy. But there is an enemy of our soul. And if there's anything that he wants to do, is he wants to destroy our faith and our confidence in God. Amen? Amen. The first thing he ever done when he came to Adam and Eve, he tried to shed doubt on the word of God when he told Adam and Eve he said hath not God said he tried to discourage them from putting confidence in the word of God today so he wants to destroy our confidence in God's ability in being able to help us now our story takes place here in this 11th chapter of 1 Samuel and uh, the previous chapter we find out how that uh, few chapters uh, before we found out that the children of Israel no longer wanted to follow a prophet or a judge, 
But they called to God and said, we want our own king. And Samuel said uh, this was displeasing to Samuel as well as it was to the Lord. But God told Samuel, go ahead and give them a king. But tell them this is the kind of king that they're going to get. But he said, they've not rejected you, but they've rejected me, says the Lord. So we know how that they appointed and anointed Saul as the king to be. Now he's been established and made the king, but he's not had his coronation. The coronation as king would not come until after this little ordeal at Jabesh Gilead. But the Bible tells us that even though they had made him a king, he went on about his normal lifestyle. He was out this day plowing in the fields with a, a herd of oxen and just uh, plowing the fields that day. But the Bible tells us that Nahash the Ammonite had besieged the city of Jabesh Gilead. And he had come against them and probably some other cities that were not told about. They had already come against them and besieged them. But in this particular chapter, he comes against uh, Jabesh Gilead. And the men of Jabesh Gilead are afraid and they know that they're outnumbered by the Ammonites. They know that Nahash has them surrounded. Nahash even knows there's no way that they can get out of this we will defeat them. And the Bible says that the men of Jabesh Gilead uh, called unto him and said that we'll serve you. And he said, the only way that I'll make a covenant with you, he said, is if you'll let me gouge out your right eye. I don't know about you, but I can't think of much of anything that I would agree to to have my right eye gouged out. I just assume you slit my throat. So that I'll fade away into oblivion and be in the presence of the Lord. Now, Nahash is so confident that he can win this battle that uh, he says, I want to gouge out your right eyes. But notice what he puts along with that. He said, I want to thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. You see, if the enemy can't defeat you, one thing he would like to do is embarrass you. If the enemy can't, des can't, can't destroy you, he would like to bring a reproach upon your life. If you'll read in the, 11, in the 10th chapter of 2 Samuel, you'll find that later, after Nahash dies, he dies here shortly, I'll tell you that here in a minute, but after he dies, uh, he was actually shown kindness unto David, and later on, when his son Hanan is reigning in Nahash's stead, David says in his heart, he said, I want to do something good for his son because he was good to me. So he sends a delegation out to Hanan. And when they get there, the Bible said they didn't trust them, so they wanted to put a reproach upon them. So he took the messengers of David, and the Bible said they cut off one half of their beard, and on the backside of their robes, they cut off their robe, a hole in it, up to the waist. So here comes these men back to David that David had sent out of the goodness of his heart but these men had laid a reproach upon him and when his men came back they came back with half of their beard uh, cut off and the front row was looking good but when they turned around their blood ox was exposed. How many times has the devil caused you to show your butt? Come on! Oh, you can look holy if you want to, but he's come against every one of us trying to lay a reproach upon us, trying to get us to do something that it will cause a reproach upon the children of Israel. And this is what Nahash wanted to do. He wanted to lay, it wasn't about necessarily putting out their eye. That wouldn't have been as useful to him, but to lay a reproach upon all the children of Israel. Amen. Now Nahash knew he was confident I could defeat this little city. And when the men of Jabesh Gilead said, give us seven days and let us see if we can find somebody to help us. If they can't, then we'll abide by your criteria and we will serve you. And it went for seven days. They looked and couldn't find anybody to help. But messengers that came to Gebeah where Saul was living. And when the messengers told the men of Gebeah the things that had taken place, the Bible said they began to weep. They just, they began to weep. You know what I would have done? I'd have went out and got my plowing shears. I'd got a box of rocks. I'd have got a stick. I'd got a two before. I'd have died fighting. I wouldn't have been. He wouldn't have been putting out my right eye. He'd have been cutting my throat because I wouldn't sit there to serve no enemy. I'd die fighting trying to get out of there. Amen. But these men in this city knew they were defeated. And they began to weep. There was nobody coming to help. Have you ever been in that situation? Hallelujah to God today. 
When you're in the long hours of the night pleading with God for help and asking God for the answer while everybody else is asleep, you're pacing the floor and tears are dropping down your cheeks and you're trying to touch God, asking God for some help. But it seems like nobody can help you in the mess, in the situation that you're in. You call the pastor, but all he can do is pray. You call the church, all they can do is pray. Maybe bring you a box of chicken and you pace the floors at night. But can I tell you today, whatever that you may be going through, my friend, hold on just a little bit longer because I believe help is on the way today. So these people were afraid. Nobody was coming to help them. And now you can be all religious if you want to. But when you're in the dead hour of the night, you're being attacked by the enemy. Religion won't help you. It don't matter what kind of license you carry with the great church of the living firstborn of the unbegotten of the dead. Your church membership can't help you. It don't matter how smart that you are. Your three master's degree can't pull you out of this hole. And you find yourself in a situation where that there is nobody to help. And the Bible said that in the afternoon that Saul came back, the man's dirty and and uh, he'd been plowing in the fields and he comes back and when he comes back he sees all the people weeping everybody down the whole city is down and Saul says why is everybody crying and somebody shared the news about Nahash the Ammonite and what he had done to the men of Jabesh Gilead and the, the uh, covenant he had drawn up with them and I want you to notice that when the messengers came to Saul and told him the tidings and all the people lifted up their voices and wept. The Bible said in verse number five, when these, when the Spirit of God, when he heard these tidings, verse number six said, the Spirit of God came upon Saul and his anger was kindled greatly. Now we've sat so long in the church, we don't know what's going on out in the world anymore. But we've sat so long in the church that we've thought and understood that the only time the Spirit of God falls is when we're shouting and when we're singing and when we're feeling good. But can I tell you, they sometimes in our life when the Spirit of God comes upon us, we need to get angry about some things today. We need to get angry about what the enemy is doing to our young people today. We need to get angry today about the defeated lives that he's putting in their minds. We need to get angry today when we send our sons to Bible college and they come back homosexuals. We need to get angry today that the enemy has brought our approach upon the church it's time that the Holy Ghost fall upon the church one more time today the spirit of God came upon Saul what we got to understand is that just because they had declared him a king he wasn't able as a man to deliver the men of Jabesh Gilead as a man, he was not able to defeat Nahash and the whole Ammonite army. But when the Spirit of God came upon him, yes. hallelujah to God, when the Spirit of God came upon him, the Bible said that he was, his anger was greatly kindled. It's time we stop getting mad at the church and stop getting mad at the preacher and start getting mad at the enemy today. It wasn't your neighbor that put you in that place. There is an enemy in our soul that is out there and he's out to divide and conquer the church. It's time that by the spirit of the living God we pull together in the unity of the spirit and stand against the wiles of the enemy because he's not only after my children, he's after your children. He's after your grandchildren. And we need the Holy Ghost in this last day. Amen. You see, Jesus said the thief don't come. But only to steal and to kill and destroy. Jesus even told Simon Peter, Satan has desired that he might get his hands on you. That he might sift you like wheat. Hallelujah to God. Peter wrote, be sober and vigilant for your adversary the devil like a roaring lion. Walketh about 
seeking whom he may devour. It is the enemy's job to slander the saints and speak ill of them. The Bible tells us in the book of Job, when Job is confronting the devil about his servant Job, Satan answered the Lord. He said, does, does Job fear God for nothing? But put forth your hand and touch everything that he has and he'll curse you to your face. He slandered the man of God. The enemy will even inflict disease. The Bible tells us that the, uh, Satan went from the presence of the Lord at that time and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. The enemy will instigate men to sin. We ought to get angry today about sin. Church used to be the place where men and women run as to a place of refuge to find deliverance from the thing that is attacking their lives. And now we have saints uh, that can't hardly wait to get out of church that they may go sip on their alcohol uh, or smoke their joint uh, or pop their pills. Uh, we ought to get angry today by the Spirit of God. Uh, it's time for a deliverance. Uh, it's time for deliverance. Uh, I'm telling you, help is on the way today. Help is on the way. So the Bible says that Saul got angry and he took two oxen, a yoke of oxen and the Bible said he cut them up in pieces sliced them right there on the spot. Be glad we don't live in Old Testament days. May have been a few days in my past history I may have cut up a cow and laid it on your porch. We need help. You're not helping Larry Holbrook by coming to church. You're helping the church. You're helping the Lord. You're doing the Lord's business. People are like, well, I get mad Larry. I just won't go to church. You ain't doing anything but fighting against God. Amen. It ain't Larry Holbrook's church. It's not Mark Tolson's church. It's not even the Pentecostal people's church. It's the church of the living God. Hallelujah to God today. Saul put up these oxen and he said, and then laid a piece of meat. Bloody, bleeding, raw meat. At the door of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And he sent word and he said the same thing is going to happen to your animals. Your oxen. You see an ox was a very handy animal. They used it to work and plow. And it was very costly. But he hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout the land. And see, it said whoever does not come forth after Saul... And after Samuel, the same would be done to their oxen. The Bible said the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. I tell you what we need today is that preachers, you can't force people what to do. And I'm not one of them preachers. People come and they say, oh, preacher, they, you know, I saw one of your members sitting down there at the bar down there at uh, old Charlie's. I've seen one of your members doing this, doing that. And, uh, I'm like, I can't answer for my members, and my members can't answer for me. Amen. I'll answer for the Lord, they'll answer for the Lord. Amen. But I've seen these preachers try these uh, tactics through their sermon to try to get people to do what they want them to do. That's witchcraft. Amen. That's witchcraft. When you use the Word of God to convince people and try to get them to do what you want them to do, that's witchcraft. Amen. But the Bible said the fear of the Lord yes. fell upon them. That's what we need in the church today. We need the fear of God to fall upon this generation one more time. The Bible tells us that there was a generation that had no fear of God before their eyes. That's what's going on with this world today is they have no fear of God before their eyes. But I believe that the church of the living God will stand up and bring forth a message of the Lord. There will be a certain respect and a fear to the preaching of the gospel of God's word today. So then the Bible said when he numbered them in Bezek and, and added in Judah there was over 330,000 men that came to fight. Can I tell you while you're in the midst of your battle while the enemy's breathing threats down your throat and you feel like you're on the seventh day and there ain't no help to be showed for can I tell you there is more than 330,000 gathering themselves together to fight your battle. Yeah. 
Hold on, cause help is on the way. Hallelujah to God today. Nahash is still confident. He still believes tomorrow uh, that we're going to take the children of Jabesh Gilead captives. Uh, we're going to put out their right eyes and make a covenant with them. Uh, but little did they know the men of Jabesh had been seeking for deliverance. Uh, the men of Jabesh Gilead had been calling for help. Uh, they'd been calling upon the men of God. Uh, and even while that Nahash would sleep through the night, uh, the Spirit of God was gathering men together. Uh, can I tell you today, it might seem like a long dark night, but hold on just a little bit longer because hell is on the way today. Hallelujah to God this morning. So, tell the messengers, you go back to the men of Jabesh Gilead and give them this message. Tomorrow, by that time the sun be hot, you shall have help. In other words, they were saying help is on the way. Help is on the way. And the men of Jabesh were glad. Well, I reckon they ought to be. Ain't it funny how that in most of the situations where we find the Lord bringing great deliverance in Israel, whether they had three days or seven days, they marched around Jericho seven days, seven times. Ain't it funny that God never moves until that last hour of the last day? Yeah. Huh? Amen. Think it not strange when you go through that long duration of time and pain and stress and worry. You just need to know in your heart that help is on the way. Yeah. When you know, even though before the help had ever came, the, J the men of Jabesh Gilead, the Bible said they was glad. Ain't it good to know when you get down in your spirit, I, even though it might be a dark night, I know that help is on the way. That's why you can shout in a jail cell at the midnight hour. I, that's why you can dance even though the healing has not happened yet. That's why you you can gain to be glad uh, even though you've not seen the answer to the prayer just because you know that hell, he don't have to be here today I just need to know that hell is on the way hold on because hell is on the way don't give up don't quit fighting because hell is on the way the Bible said so it was on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies and they came in the midst of the host in the morning watch. Think about this. He told them by the time the sun be hot, you're going to have help. But by noon the next day, the battle was already over because help was beginning in the wee hours of the morning. Hallelujah to God. If you don't shout, I'm going to shout myself. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. Ain't it good to know that God has deliverance? Ain't it yes. good to know that God sends help? Yes. We, sometimes from the most unexpected places. Ain't it good to know that at the right time, God sends the help that we need? Ha, it reminds me of the children of Israel out in the valley. Ha, and they're fighting against this great giant. Ha, and all the children of Israel hid themselves ha, in rocks and caves and hiding themselves behind bushes. Ha, but the Bible said a little boy named David came out ha, with nothing but a few stones and a slingshot. Ha, and he said, who is this big mouth giant ha, that speaks against the Lord? Ha, and David ran out on the battlefield. Ha, and Goliath ran out to meet him. Ha, and uh, Goliath said, who am I, dead dog, ha, that you'd send this little bitty boy out here to fight me? Ha, hallelujah to God today. Ha, David said, you come to me with a sword. Ha, you come to me with a stave. Ha, but I come to you in the name of the God of Israel. Ha, I tell you folks, hell is on the way today. Don't give up today. Hell is on the way. Trevor Lay, help yes. is on the way. Yes. Yes. Katie McCray, help is on the way. Yes. Hallelujah. Leonard, help yes. is on the way. Yes. Well, they were expecting help at lunchtime the next day. But well, little did they know that Saul is dividing his army up before daybreak. 
And I thought it was interesting. He divided them up in three companies so that he could take the enemy by surprise. Yeah. Ain't that just like the Father yeah. and the Son yeah. and the Holy Ghost? Yeah. I tell you, that devil may look big to you. He may look undefeatable to you. He may look like that you'll never be able to defeat him, just you and him. But I tell you, I know a great get big God that's never lost a battle against him. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, you know, we, we, we talk about the devil, and, and when we're standing in the spirit, we think of the devil as puny, as little. But the Bible said in the book of Ezekiel, he sealeth up the sun. Amen. I don't care how educated you are, he's smarter than you. Amen. He's been at this thing a long time. And if he'll, have, if he'll attack the Son of God, you ain't nothing to him. Right. You ain't nothing to him. Destroy your life is great. But if he'll attack the Son of God and tempt him, you ain't nothing to him. Hallelujah. But he is no match to the one sitting on the throne. Yeah. Woo! Matter of fact, the Bible said one of these days, every eye is going to see him, every knee is going to bow from him, and every tongue is going to confess that he is God to the glory of God the Father to those in the earth and above the earth and under the earth. There's going to be a day Satan may be having a heyday today. He may be destroying lives today, but there's coming a day he's going to get on his knees and he's going to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today. By the time the sun be hot, you shall have help. The Bible tells us in verse 11, it was so on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies and they came in the midst of the host of the morning watch and slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. See, by noontime it's over. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered so that two of them were not left together. That's what God will do for your battle. Yeah. He will defeat that enemy so bad that if they come at you one way, they'll flee leaving seven. Right. Huh? And he'll destroy them that there won't even be two to be able to come against you. Ain't that a wonderful thing? Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, this message, now I've preached before on by the time the sun be hot, you shall have hell. Preached that many years ago. And the little... Uh, story to that sermon and then I'm going to close Donnie Irvin up here at the Bergen Church of God called me to preach called me one week and asked me to come preach on Sunday morning and the Lord laid this message on my heart and I went there to preach when I went there to preach before I preached as a little lady asked for a prayer or they asked her to come up uh, she didn't go to that church she went to another church but she said she got up that morning she said I never came to mom and dad's church, but that morning I was just led to come for some reason. And they asked her to come up and get prayed for it. She'd been battling with cancer. And um, so we laid hands, prayed for her, and I didn't know her, didn't know her situation, just knew that we were praying against cancer. I preached that sermon. By the time the sun be hot, you'll have help. I went on about my business, went home that evening, and lived my life. I don't know how long it was, a few months, a few years later, I don't remember. But I went to the hospital and was visiting somebody, and I believe it was probably their mother, I was visiting in the, in the um, intensive care unit. And when I walked through the door of the waiting room, she came out and she said, ain't you Brother Holbrook? And I'm like, yeah, and she said, I got a story to share with you. She said, I went to church that morning. She said, I never go there, but for some reason I felt led. You preach that sermon. By the time the sun be hot, you shall have help. And she said, I went home the next day, and she said, I was outside working in the yard and she said I thought I went to the mailbox to get my mail and she said when I bent over I pulled the mail out and that sun was burning on the back of my neck and she said that sermon went through my mind by the time the sun be hot you shall have help and she said as soon as I felt that and that ran through my mind something hit me in my gut and my stomach she said I got so sick it was everything I could do to run to the restroom and uh, just to leave the story that she had uh, passed something that was, she was concerned about. She called the doctor, the specialist. They called her in, got to checking her out, and told her apparently whatever, whatever transpired on that day, whatever she passed must have been the cancer because she had no cancer. Oh, yeah. Can I tell you today, 
can I tell you today, I can't heal you of cancer, but I know a God that is able to heal you of cancer today. I might not be able to provide you with a new kidney, but I know a God that is able to make all things new. I might not be able to deliver you out of depression, but I know a God that is able. Hold on, because help is on the way. God will deliver his people today. Will you stand with us all over the house?